welcome back to another edition of Easy Theory. So today we're going to do a new series on our channel, which is starting from the very beginning of the course material that is typically taught in theory of computation and go all the way through in one shot all the way to the end. And at the very end, we'll have a complete playlist of all the lecture material that is that corresponds to this class, which will be really nice to have indeed. So today we're going to be looking at the question, what is a computer? And we have all these different opinions about what a computer actually is, but from a theoretical standpoint, what do we need? What do we actually need about a computer in order to understand how it works? So we can think of a bunch of things in a normal computer, such as, let's just say we have some keyboard, and then maybe we have a mouse to a uh, computer. We also may have, I don't know, cameras and maybe some other devices and whatnot. And they're all fed into the computer, which is we're going to represent by a big box like this. And some outputs of the computer might be some sound is played or something is displayed on the computer, maybe like the actual display is the actual output or maybe a file is written, or maybe something is printed, or a whole bunch of different outputs may occur. So the main idea of what a computer actually does is it takes all of these inputs and it does some kind of function to all of these outputs. So the computer, in some sense, is doing this transformation right here. That is transforming all of these inputs through some process into these outputs. And what we can actually assume is that there's exactly one input. And you may be thinking, well, there's a lot of inputs right here. How can you assume there's only one? So here's the main idea. Suppose that the keyboard has some bits x1, x2, x3, etc. The mouse has bits M1, M2, M3, etc. And let me get rid of that little dot. And the camera, let's just say, has bits C1, C2, C3. So these are the bits that are, are being fed from these particular inputs into the computer. Well, what we can do is a process called interlacing, which is we take the first bit of one of them and we write it down, so like x1. And then we take the first bit of the next component, which is m1. And then the next bit of the next component, which is c1. And then now we go back through the process again. So here we can take now x2, m2, c2. x2, m2, c2. x3, m3, c3. So if we instead feed this particular string into the computer as input, as a single input, then to recreate what the original computer did, all we need to do is to extract the appropriate bit. To say, okay, if I wanted the bits of the keyboard, I just get the um, first bit, then the fourth, and the seventh, and every third bit along the way. And we can do the exact same process with the outputs. We can interlace them in exactly the same way. So we can amend our notion of what a computer really fundamentally is to a singular input being fed into the computer. So we still have a computer here. We haven't changed that. And we have a singular output. So we're given a particular input string. We do some process and we are outputting a string. But we can actually reduce the output by a lot. Instead of having a, sing a single whole string as output, we can output a single character 0 and 1. So either we output a 0 or we output a 1 for each of the strings. And I'll invite you to figure out why we can actually assume that we can have a 0 and a 1 here. Okay, so what do we actually think about what this computer is actually doing? Well, 
in a normal computer, we have some type of, of RAM, maybe some kind of registers of some kind, maybe we have some cache, maybe we have some storage over here or something. So we have a whole bunch of things that could be happening in the system. But the main idea is we're fed input, some stuff happens, and we output a 0 or 1. We can assume a 0 or 1. So what can we actually do with this? Well, we can think of this as, well, if we are in this computer and we notice some particular structure of the RAM, the registers, and the cache, well, if we take what that actually is doing, so let's just say that this is what the machine is right now. So let's say it has some kind of RAM contents, some register contents, some cache contents, and what we do is we read a certain character. So we read one character of the input. Well, one of two things happens. Well, either the all of the contents of the system remains exactly the same, or it changes. And that's perfectly possible. So what we can do, we can think of this as, well, maybe we have a different kind of RAM which is denoted by the little prime symbol here. And then maybe we have a different register contents potentially. Maybe these are the same. I don't know necessarily. And maybe different cache contents. So what we're really doing here is we're looking at each of the characters of the input string and mapping the states of the system of this computer to another possible state of the system. So we can think of the state of the system to be all possible memory or, or data configurations of the computer. So because we, we, unless we knew anything about this particular computer, we might as well assume that every possible RAM contents are possible, every register contents are possible, and every cache contents are possible. Okay, so what we're going to do at the very start of this series is we're going to assume that the internal, the internal memory of this computer is fixed. And by that I mean we can't just continually add memory into the computer because with modern computers, theoretically, you can add as much memory as you want with external drives and whatnot. But here we're going to assume a fixed amount of memory because if we don't let it be fixed, then that fundamentally changes what we can actually compute. So if we go back here, we notice that for some inputs, we're going to output a zero. And for some inputs, we might output a 1. So what we need to do then is to say, well, there must be some way for the machine, first of all, to stop. So some uh, way to denote for the computer here to stop. And we need to have some states to be zero states. So if we end up in that state once we are done, then we're going to output a zero. And if we end up in a one state, then that means we're going to output a one if we have decided that the computer is done. So some states to be zero states and others to be one states, whatever that means. Okay. And when we turn the computer on, well, we got to start in some configuration. So we need to designate some start state, whatever that means. So some state is going to be the state where we turn the computer on and we're ready to receive input. Then the computation happens. We figure out what state we're in and then decide whether that's a zero state or a one state, and then we just have to see what actually happens there. So I hope that was interesting. I can't wait for the next few lectures where we actually get into a fundamental 
formal model for what a computer of this form would actually do, and then we'll start figuring out what problems that model can actually solve and if there are any limitations of that. So I hope that was interesting. Please like and subscribe to the channel if you thought that was interesting. Leave a comment below uh, what you thought of it and what, con what contents in this series you want to see. There are many other links in the description if you want to support this channel in other ways. And as always, I'll see you next time.